All right, are there any questions from last time? Okay, the exam will cover until the end of transcription and translation, okay? So everything is fair game, and I, want, I thought I should let you know today because that way you can start studying, you know, it's still one week away, okay? So, so far maybe you've been relaxing, but now is the time to, you know, start firing on all cylinders. I don't know right now, yeah. There'll be descriptive, see, time is not going to be a factor, okay? Like if you're not able to do something, it will not be because there are too many problems, okay? It'll be because you didn't study, okay? So you, you have to start studying, all right? All right? And it's different from like doing 314 or 214 or whatever, all right? Because there's quite a bit of memorizing and, you know, but uh, that's the power of repetitive learning, you know? So some work you have to do, you know? That is the nature of biology, okay? We cannot boil it down into some equations or something like that, so. But yeah, this exam will be like that, the next exam is like that, you know. But then after that, it's going to be engineering stuff, so. Okay. But you need to know the biology, and, and this is your opportunity to learn it, because if you don't learn it now, you'll never learn it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, up to the end of transcription and translation. Okay, so that means probably is the first, uh, is it six, six chapters, I think, yeah, because chapter five is DNA, there are four is protein, and I think transcription and translation is chapter six, yeah, okay. So it's not too bad, and, and purpose, you're getting more time because now I'm doing genetic variation, you know, so you have more time to, to read that stuff because I covered it, you know, maybe two, three lectures back. And even after the, for the second exam also, you'll get a lot of time. It'll not be that I covered stuff today and then you have to come and take the test on Monday, you know. You probably will get one week or 10 days, and we'll be doing other things, you know, mathematical stuff, but you will get time to get familiar with the biology, okay. All right, this is the chapter on genetic variation, right? And in this chapter, we will basically look at, you know, changes in the DNA that occur over evolutionary time, right? So although cells go to great lengths to maintain the integrity of the DNA, permanent changes in the DNA, which are called mutations, do accumulate over time, right? In fact, the vast diversity of life that we see around us today has arisen through changes in the DNA that have accumulated over evolutionary time. And this genetic variation or the diversity it refers to the genomic differences between different species as well as between members of the same species, right? Even members of the same species don't have exactly the same DNA, right? In fact, no two human beings have got identical genomes, that means identical DNA sequences, unless they happen to be identical twins, right? Now, it is generally believed that the conditions on this earth have undergone dramatic changes over billions of years. So in order for life to propagate, it is essential that the survivors have to be able to adapt to the changing conditions. Like if the temperature on this earth becomes like 200 degrees, so something like that, you know, most of us will be dead, okay? But there'll be a few of us probably that will survive, right? And, and then for us, it's no big deal. Like there are bacteria that can live in the vents of vol volcanoes, okay? They're called thermophilic heat-loving bacteria. They can live there, okay? So it is believed that genetic variation, although not always beneficial, is responsible for conferring survivability in a changing environment. And there are three main mechanisms by which genetic variation can arise in nature. The first one would be rare mistakes in DNA replication and repair. Right? Every time you're copying DNA, there's a chance, small chance of making mistakes. Okay? This could accumulate over time. The second one would be the recombination of DNA and the activity of viruses and other mobile genetic elements. Right? So in this chapter, we'll talk about what viruses are. Right? that can move into and out of the DNA and make changes. And the third one that causes a lot of genetic variation is the reassortment of the gene pool of the species into new combinations during sexual reproduction, right? Because in, in sexual reproduction, you inherit traits both from your uh, mother and your father, you know, and, the, and there are lots of different combinations that you can have. Now, first we look at genetic variation in bacteria, then we look at genetic variation in eukaryotic cells. Now, among bacteria, E. coli is a model organism for genetic studies. E. coli is said to have a haploid genome, right, because it has only one copy of each gene in its genome. We have two copies of each gene, right, in our genomes. E. coli has only one copy. So it's easier to study because in E. coli, if you go and mess up one of the copies, right, you will see the stuff at the observ observational level right away, okay? Whereas in the human cell, if you mess up one copy, the other copy will, might still carry you through. So you may not notice the effect, right? So we are diploid organisms means we have two copies of each gene, right? So 
a DNA for humans, a DNA mutation in one chromosome will not necessarily result in an observable phenotype, right? Okay, genotype and phenotype, you remember the terminology from before. So in this context, let's recall how an individual with only one defective beta globin gene is not going to exhibit the full-blown symptoms of sickle cell anemia because that person has the other gene, yeah, just one minute, uh, has that other gene that can still produce normal hemoglobin, okay? They will feel tired. I used to have a grad student that was a carrier of sickle cell anemia and he told me he used to feel tired uh, quite often, yeah, go ahead. Organisms, yeah, 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 yeah. What's he asking? Yeah, I didn't get it. No, no, they will not be. They will not be exactly the same. Okay, because like, you have, let's say, two copies of each gene, right? One you got from your mother, one from your father. So it'll be a little bit different, right? A little bit different. No two people have exactly the same DNA, so it'll be a little bit different. But functionally, they'll be the same. Okay. Because since you're here attending my class, you know, I assume both your genes are functioning, right? Because if they didn't, you wouldn't be here, right? Or I wouldn't be lecturing here. So functionally, they are the same, but they're a little bit different. Right? It'll not be exactly the same DNA sequence, yeah. Yeah, identical twins have a, exactly the same, same genome, right? Because they, they are from the same fertilized egg that has been split, okay, so. Yeah. So why siblings cannot have the same? Uh, DNA, yeah. uh, let me go to the end of this chapter. It'll become crystal clear to you why you won't have the same DNA. Because, you know, the odds are, you know, it's it's really huge, you know. Your chances of getting hit by lightning are a lot higher than, than, than that, you know, because the odds, the combinations, okay? Because see, I, I mean, I'll point that out when I get to the, towards the end of this chapter, but look, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? You inherit 23 chromosomes from your father, 23 from your mother, okay? Right? So uh, now each person can produce, you know, even if you don't look at other possibilities, you know, they can produce two different kinds of gametes because even your father, okay, or, or your mother, right, these two chromosomes, they'll give you one of them, but they also got two of them from their parents, right? So for each chromosome, there is a, uh, for each egg or sperm, there are two possible, I mean, on each chromosome, there are two possibilities. If you look at across 23 chromosomes, it's two to the power of 23 possibilities, okay? That fertilized by, like an egg fertilized by, by a sperm, 2 to the power of 23 times 2 to the power of 23, okay? So what are the chances that, you know, two people will have the same, same, same genome, you know, so you won't. But anyway, I'll, I'll do some calculation uh, towards the end of this chapter to, to convince you that that's not going to happen, right? Now, E. coli, like other prokaryotes or bacteria, it reproduces by a fission type cell division. See, eukaryotes, they do not, uh, they have what is called mitosis because inside a eukaryotic cell, you have the nucleus, okay? So there, there has to be a nuclear division, okay? And that nuclear division is called mitosis. In the case of eukaryotes, there's no nucleus, you know, there's just cytoplasm inside and there's a cell membrane, okay? So the DNA just replicates and usually it's a circular DNA molecule, all right? And then the two replicated DNA will move towards the two ends of the dividing cell and the stuff will pinch in the middle and you have two, two bacteria, right? So the, uh, the DNA replicates the two identical strands, move to the two ends of the growing bacterium. The bacterium then splits into two, producing two daughter cells, each containing a genome that is identical to that of the parent. Right. Now, in the presence of sufficient nutrients, a population of E. coli doubles in number every 20 to 25 minutes. Okay. So if you do the math, in 24 hours, you'll have billions of them. Okay. So in a single day, and, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in less than a day, an E. coli can produce more than 5 billion descendants. So you have more bacteria than you have humans on this earth, okay, in two days. So you're going to lose the battle, okay. Now, every time that a cell divides, the DNA has to be replicated, which means that there is a possibility of some mistakes, all right? Now, the rapid rate of division of E. coli means that very large populations of E. coli cells in which DNA mutations have occurred can be produced quite rapidly, okay. You hear about bacteria developing resistance to antibiotics and all that because it will develop the mutation, okay, and, and so it can survive the antibiotic. And this can be illustrated using an example. Now, E. coli bacteria can be qu quite easily used to demonstrate how DNA mutations will confer survivability in a changing environment. For example, consider the antibiotic rifampicin, okay. I have never been prescribed by this one. I haven't, like you hear about, you know, amoxicillin, you know, 
and others, you know, but I guess, I suppose this is also one of the antibiotics, right? I don't know why they picked it. But like many other antibiotics, the way they work is that they will bind tightly to RNA polymerase, bacterial RNA polymerase inside the E. coli cell and prevent it from transcribing DNA to RNA, right? Now, if, if the cell cannot, you know, tra transcribe DNA to RNA, it cannot produce the proteins that it needs and the cell will die, right? The E. coli bacterium dies. However, in a large population of E. coli, say you have a billion, uh, billion cells of E. coli, there will be some cells which are rifampicin resistant, okay? So if you treat a population like this with rifampicin, most of the cells will die, okay? But the few that survive, right, they will keep on dividing. And, and remember, in a day, you're going to have five billion, right? So they will take over the population, right? And this rifampicin resistance here comes from mutations in the DNA, which will allow RNA polymerase for, for those, like the, those, those mutant cells to transcribe even in the presence of rifampicin, right? So the treatment of using antibiotics is based on that, going and blocking RNA polymerase, right? Bacterial RNA polymerase, right? So that transcription cannot take place. All right, any questions? So at least you learn now how, how antibiotics work, all right? And something, all right? Now the principle that we have encountered here, namely the ability of antibiotics to block bacterial transcription is the basis for current day treatment of bacterial infections using antibiotics. The reason that this treatment is ineffective against viral infections, because if you have a cold or something, right, they don't give you antibiotics, right? It has to heal by itself, right? I mean, is, is that a virus doesn't have its own transcription and translation machinery, which the antibiotic could have targeted. So if somebody gives you an antibiotic to kill the virus, they will kill you because your cells will not be able to produce the proteins that you need to survive, right? Okay, so instead, as we shall see, a virus relies on hijacking the replication machinery of the host cell in order to propagate itself, right? The job of the virus is to get inside the host cell and use the cell's um, DNA replication, or, uh, you know, uh, transcription machinery to make many, many copies of itself, right? At your expense, right? And, and we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, a, li a little later. Now, bacterial cells can also acquire genes from other bac bacteria, right? For example, if we mix a laboratory strain of E. coli, which lacks one of the enzymes for making an essential amino acid. Essential amino acid will be an amino acid that the bacterium needs in order to survive, okay? So if you mix two strains, one of them la lacks, let's say, essential amino acid number A, see, it'll be non-essential uh, non if the bacterium can make it, right? But essential amino acid is something that it will have to make in order to survive, right? So uh, with another strain that lacks one of the enzymes from making another essential amino acid, and if the mixture is allowed to grow together for a few hours, then you transfer it to a medium that lacks both amino acids, okay? So if, if there was no DNA exchange between the two bacteria, you know, two classes of bacteria, then all of them would die because now both the amino acids are not there, okay? They're, they're missing something essential, okay? But if you do that, you'll see many rapidly growing bacteria can be found in the new medium. And the genome of the new bacterial strain is composed of normal genes for the synthesis of both the essential amino acids, okay? So that means there is some gene transfer that, that goes on. Yeah. Yeah, a virus is basically an RNA or DNA inside a protein coat. That's, that's what it is. Inside a protein coat, inside a protein uh, cover, okay? There's a protein cover with DNA or RNA inside. That's it. Virus is not a living object, right? It cannot replicate itself, all right? It does not have any DNA polymerase or anything. A cell is a living object because it can make more copies of itself, right? It can produce new cell by cell division. Virus is not a living object, right? Okay, virus is just DNA or RNA. Some of them are DNA viruses, some are RNA viruses encapsulated inside a protein coat. That's what it is. Now, genes can be transferred from one bacterium to another by a process which is called bacterial mating. The ability to initiate mating and gene transfer seen in some bacteria is conferred by genes that are contained in what are called bacterial plasmids, right? What are plasmids? Plasmids are small, circular, double-stranded DNA molecules that are separate from the larger bacterial chromosome, right? And a plasmid that commonly initiates mating in E. coli is what is called the F plasmid or the fertility plasmid. When a bacterium carrying the F plasmid, the donor encounters a bacterium that lacks the plasmid, a cytoplasmic bridge is formed between the two cells, and the, the fertility plasmid is replicated, and that DNA gets transferred from the donor through the bridge to the recipient. 
and finally the bridge breaks and I'm going to show that to you in a picture finally the bridge breaks down and the two bacteria both of which now contain the fertility plasmid and act as donors in subsequent encounters with recipient bacteria. And this is explained in this diagram, right? So you, here you have these two bacteria. Initially, this bridge is not there. This is a donor one because it has the fertility plasmid. This is the bacterial chromosome. The blue stuff is the fertility plasmid. Small uh, DNA molecule or a circular DNA molecule. This has information for making that bridge, right? So this is the donor that's the recipient. So uh, the, the information here will be used to produce this cytoplasmic bridge and then there will be DNA replication, right? See, this thing opens up and it will go in here. And, uh, you know, uh, you have replication starting here, right? Then starting here, and at the end, you basically have each bacterium has now got a fertility plasmid, okay? This is called rolling circle replication. This, the way in which this thing is replicated, and, you know, you get one copy here, another one here, right? It's called rolling circle re re replication. So you basically first open this out, then you take it here, then you start using that as a template to produce a copy, and then make another copy looking at the e inner circle, right? Make another copy. Yeah. Will Yeah, it will disappear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After, after it's done, the, the bridge will disappear. Yeah. Because the proteins that are responsible for producing the bridge, maybe the transcription of that is turned off, okay? Transcription and translation, yeah. It will disappear. It will not be a permanent thing, right? Now, the problem is with this, you would, will not have that much of genetic variation because this is a small stretch of DNA, right? So it's only a limited number of genes that will be transferred from the donor to the recipient, right? However, there can be situations where this thing actually combines with the bacterial chromosome, right? And then when it leaves the bacterial chromosome, it can take some of that with it, okay? So producing genetic uh, diversity or genetic variation. Now, the fertility plasmid or the F plasmid is necessary for mating because it carries genes that encode some of the proteins that are required to make the cytoplasmic bridge and to transfer the DNA, right? And as I said, the bacterial mating via the fertility plasmid does not generate much genetic variation since the fertility plasmid that is transferred contains only a small number of genes. However, occasionally, the fertility plasmid can get integrated into the bacterial chromosome, right? with the result that when it now initiates mating and gene transfer, it can now take parts of the bacterial chromosome with it, okay? Because you, it merges with the bacterial chromosome, but when it excises itself, it will take some part of the bacterial chromosome with it. Also, bacteria, so here we are basically talking about all the different mechanisms by which, you know, the purity of the DNA can be altered, you know? It's not going to remain the purebred DNA, right? Because of all these different things that happen. Now, bacteria can take up DNA from their surroundings. For example, DNA can be taken up from other dead bacteria in the surroundings. This process is called transformation since it can transform one strain of bacteria into another. And recall that experiment from chapter five when you had the smooth strain and the rough strain, right? The rough strain was non-pathogenic that got transformed to the smooth strain when it was grown in the presence of heat killed smooth strain, right? So it, this can happen, okay, where, where one strain of bacteria gets transformed into another. Now, the most important route by which DNA becomes incorporated into a bacterial genome is what is called homologous re recombination. Homologous recombination can take place between two DNA molecules of similar nucleotide sequence. They are not identical, very similar, right? A lot of matching up is there. They come next to each other, then they cross over, right? So this is shown in the, in the next figure. So let me go to the figure first, right? So here you have like two uh, DNA strands, double-stranded DNA, right? They come next to each other. Very similar sequence, right? Then they just cross over, right? This gets attached to the one at the bottom. And that one gets, uh, the green gets attached to the red uh, and, and vice versa, right? This kind of crossover can take place, right? And, uh, and this is referred to as homologous recombination, right? So this is shown in the figure. And the same figure also shows how they can then cross over. The net result is homologous recombination. Cells utilize specialized proteins to facilitate homologous recombination, and such recombination enzymes are well characterized in bacteria, but are only beginning to be understood in eukaryotic cells. Right? But again, I mean, this is 10 years old, so maybe now somebody else might have gotten a Nobel Prize for understanding the details of this. Okay? It's just that I don't know, because I don't keep track of all this. Okay, now, if you do have these kind of exchanges, homologous exchanges, right? 
you can have a situation there is some DNA fragment. This is homologous to the red one here. And then you have two exchanges, all right? And then this green is transferred basically with two crossovers, the green can be transferred onto the red one. So now you have a recombinant bacterial genome, all right? It's been altered, okay? I mean, it, it, these two are similar, but they're not exactly the same. So there is genetic variation here. Another example could be how does the fertility plasmid integrate with the bacterial chromosome? Well, you just need one crossover because if you get one crossover, this could link up to that side. This could link up here. Then you unwind it, right, or you uncoil it. And now you have a bacterial chromosome that includes the uh, integrated uh, fertility plasmid, right? Now, later on when this plasmid leaves the bacterial chromosome, right, it might take a little bit of this DNA within. And, and then, you know, when it, um, like uh, uh, when it interacts with another donor bacterium, uh, another uh, recipient bacterium, it will transfer some of the genes from the from this bacterial chromosome over there. Yeah. No, no, no. It happens in eukaryotes also. Okay, I'll talk about that. In, yeah, even in your cells, it will happen. Okay, when you get a cold, okay, the virus will come and change some of your DNA. Right. No escape. So. <laughs> now, gene transfer can also be carried out by bacterial viruses, you know. Viruses don't just attack you and me, they also attack bacteria, right? So bacterial viruses or bacteriophages, these are viruses which invade bacterial cells. Now, getting back to your question, who asked me about the, the virus, okay? Yeah, so virus is usually composed of DNA that is enclosed inside a protein coat, right? Into, inside a coat of protein, it could also be RNA. A virus will enter a bacterial cell, and that's true even for our cells also. It'll get into the cell, and it'll use the cell's DNA replication, transcription, and translational machinery to produce, number one, more copies of its own DNA, and more copies of its coat protein. Okay, so then there's more material to package and make more viruses. Okay. So the replicated DNA is packaged into additional protein coats to produce progeny viruses, which can leave the current bacterial cell and invade other cells. Right. And viral reproduction is usually lethal or deadly for the infected cell, and the cell bursts open, lysis as a result of the infection. Like when you get a cold, okay, that runny nose and all that stuff, that is cytoplasm from the cells, right? Because the virus has killed a lot of the cells, okay? Made more copies of itself and, and you know, left the dead cells behind. Okay. Now, when a virus invades a bacterial cell, one of two things can happen. First, you know, it could be that the cell bursts open and many copies of the virus are released, okay? That's why they talk about all these diseases, you know, you're going to give the flu to somebody else and, and all that stuff, you know, because many copies of the virus are released, so somebody else will pick it up. And that's one possibility. The other one is that the virus can sit dormant. The viral genome, the genome of the virus, because remember, the virus contains DNA or RNA. That can get integrated into the bacterial chromosome. And every time the bacterium dis uh, divides, right, the viral genome is also replicated along with the bacterial ge uh, genome and passed on. Right? Now, at some point in time, you go, I mean, it's, it's lying there dormant, right? but at some point in time, let's say you give an insult, such as ex ex exposure to ultraviolet light would induce the viral genome to leave the host chromosome and begin a lytic phase of viral replication, right? That means kill the cell and release a lot of copies of the virus, all right? Now, most of the time, it's route one that is followed. You know, it doesn't stay dormant. Most of the time, it will go there, kill a lot of cells, make more copies of itself, right? And then get out. But sometimes, route two also is followed. Now, the viral genome usually integrates with the bacterial genome by sites, what is called site-specific recombination, which is carried out by an enzyme that is called integrase. And again, these are just details for your information. It's not, there's nothing really much to understand over there. Now, on leaving a host chromosome, the viral DNA will occasionally remove itself inaccurately and bring along a neighbor, neighboring piece of host DNA in place of part of its own DNA. Right. And this host DNA will be packaged into a virus particle along with the viral DNA. So the next time when the, this virus infects a new host, it will introduce along with its own viral DNA DNA that it had picked up from the previous host, right? We are just, we are not saying how exactly it will happen or that something systematic has to happen. We are just saying that there are a lot of things that will cause changes in the DNA okay. over evolutionary time. So this bacterial DNA can now become part of the new host chromosome in at least a couple of ways. Number one, the incoming virus could integrate into the new host chromosome, right? 
or if the incoming virus does not destroy the host, the passenger bacterial DNA could become a permanent part of the host genome by homologous recombination. Right. And this process is called transduction. So a lot of things, a lot of different, uh, you know, possibilities for messing up the pureness of the DNA, okay, whether it is in virus or even if it's in us. Right. Now, many bacterial and eukaryotic genomes, they contain stretches of DNA that are called transposable elements. They can move around, right? Which can move from place to place within the chromosome by a process that is called transposition. And, and somebody brought up this topic, I think, last time, you know, whether things can move around. They can, right? So transposons move within the DNA of their host by means of special recombination enzymes, which are called transposases, encoded by the transposable element to create great genetic diversity. And you can have two types of transposition, right? You could have, like this is a donor DNA, so this is a target DNA. So if it is non-replicative transposition, this thing will be cut out and just put in over there, okay? So this is the new DNA sequence, right? Target DNA, the, from the donor you cut this out. In replicative transposition, the donor DNA doesn't change. You just make a copy of this and stick it in there, right? In there. Now, we know that most alterations in the genome are harmful to the individual bacterium, and these are quickly eliminated from the population, right? If some mutation in the DNA, right, makes the bacterium not viable, right, cannot survive, then they are gone. However, these alterations also will confer survivability in a changing environment, as was demonstrated by the example involving that antibiotic rifampicin. Now, so we have talked a lot about bacteria, okay, bacteria phages, you know, bacterial transposition and so on, okay. What about the case of eukaryotic cells, okay, what, what co could cause genetic variation? Unlike bacterial DNA, eukaryotic DNA has got both coding and non-coding regions. What are they called? Anybody remember? Okay, good. Okay, so you're getting prepared, right? <laughs> or maybe you already knew it from before, okay. So in prokaryotes, the rate of cell division is very high. And hence, there is strong selective pressure to minimize the amount of superfluous DNA in the genome, right? So they think that this is the reason why prokaryotic genomes don't have gotten rid of all that intron DNA, okay? You don't have, have that anymore. Now, eukaryotic genomes are also characterized by a large amount of gene duplication that has occurred over evolutionary time. As a result, there could be several genes belonging to the same family. And the most well-documented example is the beta globin gene family. That's one of the subunits of hemoglobin, right? And the human genome has a total of five beta globin genes, right? So these genes encode the beta subunits of the various hemoglobins produced at different times during embryonic, fetal, and adult life. So you have different hem hemoglobins that you're using, right? When you're, when you're at the embryonic stage, when you're a fetus, okay? When you're a kid, and then when, you, when you're an adult, okay? All that information is there in your genome. So how does gene duplication occur, right? So they think that gene duplication occurs like this, all right? So if you're, so if you're going to have homologous recombination, all right, the, the two genes, this is double-stranded DNA, this is double-stranded DNA over here, okay? Similar, with similar sequences, they'll align, okay? And then there will be a crossover. So that causes genetic variation, right? That brings in some diversity. But you might have a situation where the alignment is wrong, okay? The, instead of aligning up like this, they align this way, okay? Maybe this sequence and this sequence match up, all right? Now, if there is a crossover, then one of these chromosomes, all right, will have two copies of this gene, okay, from here and from here. The other guy has nothing, right? So the individuals that inherit this one, right, that will not be a functional gene. They are eliminated from the population, right? Nature has its way of, you know, getting rid of non-performers, okay? If you cannot produce the protein you need, you're gone, right? But the ones that survive, right, they're going to have two copies of the globin gene, right? Yeah, go ahead. So, um, how do you detect misalignment? No, no, I don't detect misalignment, okay? I mean, like, over time it has happened, right? Because that's how they think that it has happened. Because otherwise, how, why is it that we have five different beta globin genes, okay? I mean, you, you really needed one, right? I mean, you have five different, and probably there are others also. You have many copies of those, right? And, uh, uh, you know, th this is something that we are not detecting because it has happened over evolutionary time, okay, thousands, maybe millions of years, yeah. Uh, five different genes, they exactly the same 
not exactly not exactly the same L little bit different yeah. and, and they are especially well suited for the particular time in your life okay like if it's a fetus they're using one okay so there have been some adaptations that have gone on okay so i don't know the answers to those but if you look at the human genome you'll find five copies of this okay and uh, furthermore they have done experiments to see that you know each copy is suited for a particular stage in development you know? because these things like see we know about them for you know very few years okay but like uh, i have a colleague in biology he says you know when you're trying to fight cancer right these are cancer drugs these are only 50 60 years old or maybe 40 years old okay but he says the cancer cell is very intelligent okay because it has gotten billions of years to learn and and you know fool you you know you think you're smart you know that one has got so much of history right so so it's the same thing here how this develop over evolutionary time we don't know you know but these are just some of the theories okay yeah, I wouldn't be able to tell because I would not even be even able to see that crossover in real time. Okay, because this is this may happen, it may not happen. Today, with the techniques that we have, the laboratory techniques, all right, we can actually do a lot of these things in the lab. Okay, we don't have to wait for a million years for things to happen. Okay, we can cut out DNA, put it somewhere else, and try all kinds of experiments. Okay, so what I showed you in this picture, gene duplication is thought to occur from a rare recombination event between two homologous chromosomes. Consider the case of the beta globin gene duplication. Instead of aligning properly for a crossover, the two homologous chromosomes align in an improper fashion as shown in the figure that I showed you. After the crossover, the long chromosome has got two copies of the globin gene, while the short chromosome lacks the original globin gene. Consequently, the individuals that will inherit the short chromosome, they'd be expected to be eliminated from the population. While the individuals that inherit the long chromosome, they'd be expected to have two beta globin genes instead of one. Right. And genes encoding new proteins can also be created by the recombination of exons, right? And the general scheme is the same here, except that, you know, the, it's not just the entire gene, but it's just the coding region that is involved. And I have a slide showing that too, right? So the same kind of thing can happen involving only exons, right? This is duplication of exons. So you have exon A, exon B, right? In between there is uh, this non-coding region, right? So again, I mean, if there was a proper crossover, this exon A would align up with exon A, exon B with exon B. If there's, you know, unequal or improper crossing over, let's say the crossover took place here. Now we have exon A, exon B, exon B, right? On the long chromosome, and the short guy only has exon A. Right. So you now have exon duplication, okay? Not just gene duplication. Now one more thing, note, because you have introns, there is a lot more possibility for crossovers, okay? Which will not mess up the coding regions, right? So the presence of introns in uh, eukaryotic DNA greatly increases the chances of this kind of recombination. You know? Because if stuff gets messed up, if you cannot produce the correct protein and all that, then that, uh, you know, that particular cell will be eliminated from the population. That organism will be eliminated. But because you have introns, you know, that makes it possible that you'll have crossovers and you will still be functioning. Right? You still have functional genes. So the general scheme for gene duplication, which is shown in the figure that I, that I showed you two slides later, is the same as before, except that an exon within a gene rather than the entire gene is duplicated. So, and this is just stating what I mentioned. Without introns, there would be very few sites on the original gene at which a recombinational exchange between homologous chromosomes could duplicate the domain without damaging it. Therefore, introns greatly increase the probability that DNA duplications will give rise to functional genes encoding functional proteins. Right. And moreover, the presence of introns greatly increases the probability that a chance recombination event can generate a functional hybrid gene by joining together two initially separate exons coding for quite different protein domains. And this is referred to as exon shuffling, right? Exon A, exon B, exon C from some, somewhere else, you know? You, you, you combine them together and still it'll be functional. So the introns make those exchanges possible. Now about 10% of the human genome consists of two families of transposable sequences. Now transposable DNA elements, they move from place to place by the mechanisms that have been discussed earlier for prokaryotic transposons, all right? Remember we talked about replicative transposition and non-replicative, same kind of thing happens here also. However, for eukaryotics, uh, eukaryotes, there are also what are called retrotransposons for which an RNA copy is first made using RNA polymerase, 
following which DNA copies are made using reverse transcriptase, right? Why is that, right? So let me show you in the picture, right? So you have the donor DNA, right? So that is going to get copied somewhere, right? But see, this will have both coding and non-coding, right? So before doing that, if you use RNA polymerase from the DNA, it can transcribe the DNA, give you RNA, right? But in, in the case of eukaryotes, that RNA will become a messenger RNA or a continuous coding sequence. Then you use reverse transcription to get the, the complementary DNA, right? So you have gotten rid of all the introns, right? And now this can be used and in, inserted into, into target DNA, right? So there are also retro uh, tra transposons, okay? That will first make an RNA copy, then go back. And, and the intent here is basically to get rid of the, the non-coding region, right? So for eukaryotes, there are also retro transposons for which an RNA copy is first made using RNA polymerase, following which DNA copies are made using reverse transcriptase. And it is this, these DNA copies that are then inserted into the target. Now, transposition by reverse transcription is shown in the figure that I pointed out a short while ago. And examples of human retrotransposons are the so-called L1 tra transposable element and the ALU sequence. Again, for us, these are just some names, okay? I mean, I don't know the, de the details about these uh, individual retrotransposons. Now, the evolution of genomes has been greatly accelerated by transposable elements, okay? Because they're causing changes, you know, like, you put in new DNA somewhere, you, you might have messed something up, you might have messed up transcription, okay, or translation or whatever. So the insertion of a transposable element in a regulatory region for a gene will often, by disrupting or adding short regulatory sequences, have a dramatic effect on gene expression. Now, another source of genetic variation in eukaryotes is the activity of viruses. Just like in bacteria, you have bacteriophages that can come in. In the case of eukaryotes also, and we know that we catch cold all the time, right? I mean, flu, cold, and all that stuff, you know? So like bacteriophages, viruses that infect eukaryotic cells are fully mobile elements that can move into or out of our cells. And viral genomes can be made either of DNA or RNA and can be single-stranded or double-stranded. An important class of viruses is what are, what are called retroviruses, which reverse the normal flow of genetic information. The normal flow of genetic information is DNA to RNA protein, right? If you look at the HIV virus, which causes AIDS, that's a retrovirus, okay? It has got RNA, so you, uh, RNA inside a protein code. So that RNA has to be first converted into a DNA by reverse transcription, right? And then it'll, it's going to integrate into the uh, genome of the host cell. So the retroviruses have a genome that is made of RNA and have a protein code that encapsulates the genome. And also this enzyme reverse transcriptase, because from the RNA, you have to make the DNA. You need that enzyme too, right? So the schematic diagram for a retrovirus hijacking a host, shell, host cell is shown in the next figure, right? So here you have a retrovirus. So this is like your, the RNA, the blue one is the RNA inside. Then you have the reverse transcriptase because that's needed to convert from RNA to, to complementary DNA. Then you have this protein coat and, uh, you know, there'll be some lipids and all that in, in the boundary of this. So the way it's going to attack the eukaryotic cell is that the boundaries will fuse, okay? So this thing will come out, then this guy will get in, okay? Now, then for here you have the RNA, then you have the reverse transcriptase. From RNA, so RNA and, uh, will be acted upon by reverse transcriptase, right? Reverse transcription to give you complementary DNA. So it'll give you single-stranded DNA, right? That's the, let's say the red one. Then, so the blue one is the RNA, okay? The RNA can still be degraded, but this complementary DNA that you have, that's a much more stable molecule. That can be worked upon by uh, our, uh, DNA polymerase, which is there in the cell, all right? And it'll, it'll make it double-stranded DNA, viral DNA. Right now, so from that RNA, you now have double-stranded viral DNA. That can get integrated into the host chromosome, all right? Every time the cell divides, all right, it'll make copies of this too, okay? Now, when the cell, this cell, this eukaryotic cell does transcription and translation, it will produce the, that RNA, right? It'll produce that RNA. When it does the translation, it will produce many other proteins, but it will also produce these viral proteins, these green guys, all right? And so what is going to happen? When this cell is killed, okay, when the next generation of viruses is released, there will be many more of these that will be formed, just like this one, right? And in the process, the cell got killed, okay? That's what happens when you get a cold, okay? Virus, yeah? Uh, 
No, no, this, they, no, the coat will come from here. Yes, there is enough information in there for producing the protein coat. Okay, it, it will have that information for producing the, 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 those proteins. Okay, right one. No, it'll be co many copies of the virus, yeah. Copies of the virus, yeah. Yeah, but they might be a little bit different, like, I mean, it might, when it came out, maybe there's something else that got attached or something. There could be some variation, but in general, it'll be many. The goal is, here is to produce many copies of this virus. Yeah. Yes. Why? Because you need to produce DNA, reverse transcriptase, all right? Oh, why, why the bacteria already has uh, RNA polymerase? Is that what you're saying? Or oh, DNA polymerase? Yeah, no, because they, they don't have the replication machinery. The virus, it just has this, okay? It does not have the ability to make more copies of the RNA or DNA or anything, you know? That's why it needs your cell, okay? That's why it needs your body and to make you sick and make more copies of it. And if it could do it by itself, then it then doesn't need to infect you. So in the case of retroviruses, the enzyme reverse transcriptase is first used to make a single-stranded complementary. This is what I showed in the picture. Complementary DNA copy of the viral genome. Then the enzyme DNA polymerase present in the host cell is then used to create a double-stranded DNA copy of the viral genome which is then integrated into the host DNA. Then transcription and translation from the integrated genome produces copies of the viral RNA, reverse transcriptase, and the code protein. And all of these can be packaged together to produce additional retroviruses. Now, retroviruses that have picked up host genes can make cells cancerous, right? Very few human cancers are caused by retrovirus infection. But these viruses are a prominent cause of cancers in some animals. And the best example of that is what is called the Rouse sarcoma virus. So right, sarcoma is a tumor. It's a big, big tumor, right? Big, big cancerous tumor, right? So this virus can pick up a gene from its chicken host. Okay, it infects chickens. This gene, the gene that it picks up, is called SRC. It is unnecessary baggage from the point of view of the virus, but it has got profound consequences for cells that are infected by the virus. The normal SRC gene in the chicken genome, it encodes a protein kinase. What does a kinase do? Does anybody remember? Uh -uh. No, no, you need to study, okay, all of you. It adds a phosphate, yeah. So this guy is studying. So associate with him, okay, I'll study more. Anyway, so it adds a phosphate group. And as I said before, you know, eukaryotic cells have the property that by adding a phosphate, right, change the, the shape of the protein a little bit, okay, and turn it on, okay, or off, okay. And in fact, that is how eukaryotic cell division is controlled. So there, this is a protein kinase, this normal SRC gene. So it will turn, turn on cell division in resp response to the right stimulus, okay? But oftentimes, so it is called a proto-oncogene because it's a gene that hasn't become cancerous, right? But, uh, so it, it responds to the right stimulus to turn on cell division. But the SRC gene that is carried by the virus, when it picks it up from the chicken hose, it might have messed it up a little bit. It's not quite identical to the normal cellular gene. And it, it, it may be turning on cell division, right? when it's put back in the chicken, even when no new cells are needed, okay? And this difference gives rise to the, its ability to cause a cancer. The mutated SRC gene is called an oncogene, all right? Oncogene is a cancer-causing gene, all right? It'll turn on cell division even when there is no stimulus, all right? And it causes the infected cell to divide uncontrollably. So this is an example of a cancer that can be caused by a virus, all right? So very few human cancers are, are, are caused by viruses. But in case of animals, there are examples. Okay, now we get to the issue about your question about why, you know, the two, whatever, siblings are not going to be identical, okay? So, now bacteria reproduce asexually, and this gives rise to offspring that are identical to the parent, because there's, it's just a fission type of cell division, right? Sexual reproduction, on the other hand, involves the mixing of genomes from two individuals to produce offspring that are genetically distinct from one an another and from both their parents. Sexual reproduction occurs in diploid organisms. You have to have two copies of each chromosome, in which each cell contains two sets of chromosomes, one inherited from each parent. The actual cells that carry out sexual reproduction in diploid organisms are called the germ cells or the gametes. Right? 
these gametes which are haploid cells are of two types the egg and the sperm in animals so you know the egg and the sperm will have one copy of each chromosome right all other cells they have two copies okay so the 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 particular copy that is passed onto the egg or the sperm you know that that's at random okay it's, it, so that so the haploid germ cells are generated from the diploid precursors by a special type of cell division which is called meiosis right and we we'll talk about meiosis and mitosis later on but here i just want to show you what the odds are of two people having the same genome all right so our main focus here is on showing the staggering amount of genetic variation that results from meiosis a schematic diagram showing how meiosis produces haploid gametes from a diploid precursor is shown in the figure so let's go to the figure a big figure is worth you know 10000 words you know just 1000 so here let's say this is a cell all right this is a germ cell precursor right and we are focusing only on one pair of chromosomes all right paternal chromosome maternal chromosome there are 23 pairs like this all right now meiosis it involves halving of the number of chromosomes so if from this cell if you have to produce the egg or the sperm all right the gamete all you needed to do is basically split the cell in two and get one one of these to go into one cell and the other one into the other okay for some unknown reason that's not how it happens all right basically there is dna replication and then there will be two rounds of cell division okay that's the way it happens so you have dna replication the paternal one is replicated the maternal one is replicated not only that after that paternal and maternal chromosomes they are homologous chromosomes right like chromosome number 1 paternal maternal copy they are homologous they will line up next to each other right and there are crossovers also that will take place so there is more genetic variation over there okay and then once the, see the part of this one has gone right see this portion has now gone to the, the bottom one okay now there will be two rounds of cell splitting okay to produce four of these one two three four right so there will be four different types of gametes okay that will be produced so there are two rounds of cell division one division here then another round so you have four different types of possible gametes okay this is for one chromosome right there are 23 pairs of chromosomes right even if you didn't have any crossovers so if you have crossovers you are getting four if i didn't have any crossovers i would have two different types of gametes okay so on 23 chromosomes if you look at that the total number of possibilities is 2 to the power of 23 on an average there is at least one crossover on each chromosome right now the egg and the sperm will fuse so there are 2 to the power of 23 possibilities for eggs 2 to the power of 23 possibilities for sperm okay you fuse them together look at the number of possible and that is without crossovers if there are crossovers on an average it it will be like 4 to the power of 23 okay so so the odds that you know two people will get the you know unless it's an identical twin you know you get the same genome are, are almost zero you know, so what the other two need to the chromosome they are the same no 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 22 chromosomes No, the same same thing will happen with. No, it's just like this one. All of them, it's like that. Okay. Okay. Let me explain. Then we discuss. You know. So, yeah. Go ahead. You you have the you have four different. No no no. Yeah yeah four four different. See for from this one you got four right from one chromosome right one chromosome pair. Each chromosome pair, you'll have four different possibilities, okay, including crossover. Each chromosome pair. So if it is 23 times, it'll be four to the power of 23, okay, different possibilities. Like for on chromosome one, okay, you got the paternal, maternal, okay. After the crossover, there are four possibilities. So in this location, in the chromosome two, there are another four possibilities, okay. And this is just the egg or the sperm. Another one, four possibilities. If you don't allow cross crossovers, every every chromosome there are two possibilities. Okay, what are you going to inherit? Right. So the numbers are really huge, and we we will see this again a little bit later because I will talk about cell division also. All right. So mitosis and meiosis. So so we focus attention on only one pair of homologous chromosomes, like I did in that picture. During meiosis, the chromosomes first duplicate, and then the homologous paternal and maternal chromosomes line up next to each other. Next crossover takes place by homologous recombination, and two rounds of cell splitting occur to produce four different haploid gametes, okay, which is what I showed in that picture. So clearly, in the absence of a crossover, each pair of homologous chromosomes will give rise to two different types of gametes. Okay, if I didn't have any crossover, instead of four, I would have two, depending on whether it contains the paternal homolog or the maternal homolog. With 23 chromosome pairs in the human genome, 
Each individual can produce two to the power of 23 possible gametes. The actual number of possible gametes is much higher because of crossovers. And on an average, there is at least one crossover on each chromosome. So to develop a new organism, two such gametes of the opposite kind, egg and sperm, have to fuse to form the single diploid cell that will undergo repeated mitosis, right? repeated cell division, to develop into the new organism. Thus, the number of possible ways in which the genetic material gets reshuffled during sexual reproduction is staggering. And that is the reason that it is not at all surprising that no two individuals, except identical twins, have the same genome. Hopefully, I answered your question at the beginning of the class, OK? So now you don't have to think, or you know, it, it's just not going to happen, OK, that two people are going to have the same genome. Very, 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 very unlikely. All right, any, any other questions? So I'm done for today, right? So next time we will talk about DNA technology because this is variation that takes place in nature, okay? But in this day and age, especially in the last 40 years, people have developed techniques where they can go and do all kinds of things. You know, you can cut out DNA from one organism, put it in another, right? Like you've already seen that, you know, growing eyes in the middle of the legs and things like that, you know? So, and that is what is going to be important for, and that's where the double E's and all will come in, okay? Because taking the data from here and analyzing that, and there's a lot of demand for, you know, people with quantitative skills, okay?